You know, when I was a boy, I loved Tinker Toys, American Bricks. There was no Legos back then, you know, I'm aging myself. Um, you know, there was, there was just all these various projects, and I loved to build things. And just intuitively, I just thought, for some reason, I would like to be an architect. I got into high school, and when I was a senior, we had to take a class that was, a, that was a, about um, choosing an occupation and doing research on it. So I thought this is perfect because up to this point, really wasn't that aware of exactly what architects do except they get to draw great stuff. And I love to draw. And um, so I got onto, my mother's a librarian and she was able to have me access all kinds of materials. Now this was in Southern California where I grew up. Um, and I'll never forget finding this survey that showed that, you know, all the education an architect would need to go through, how many years that would take, um, how long he would have to apprentice before he would actually get his license. And then after you were licensed, they basically showed a survey that a window washer in San Francisco made almost twice as much money as an architect after, I believe, four years experience it kind of squelched my dream. And so um, at that point, I wasn't sure what I wanted to go into. So I, um, I left the country for a couple of years serving a mission for the, the church I belonged to. And um, when I came back, I started college at Santa Monica College there in Southern California. And just taking general ed because I wasn't sure what direction I wanted to go into. But I had one class that was in the same building that all the architecture classes were, and there was one class in particular that was a rendering class, watercolors, markers, and so forth. And I just thought, I've got to take that class. So I took that class, and the professor, the teacher, um, said, you know, you really have a talent here. You should go into architecture. But at that point, I finally decided that, you know, it wasn't about the money. It was, it was about the love of, of what you're doing. And, um, and I figured, you know, if I'm good at, my rationale at the time was, well, you know, if you're good at what you're doing, the money will come. And um, so maybe it didn't come in, in, in as big as hunks as I was looking for, but um, I certainly love the profession and that's why um, I chose to go into architecture. So um, I started at Santa Monica College um, and while I was there, I met my wonderful wife. We uh, moved from Santa Monica after going a year at college there. I moved up to the University of Utah. And um, I love to ski, <laughs> so it made sense. I actually graduated first in urban planning, and which was back then was in the geography department. It was a, a new program, and then of course went into the um, architecture school and graduated there. Um, while I was uh, attending school, um, I pretty much worked the entire time. Um, at first, when I was doing my undergraduate work, I would take construction jobs during the summer and even during Christmas break um, a couple of times. My first, first job with an architect was a firm Silver Allsop, which is no longer around, but they did schools. And this was during school. And while I was there, um, um, Roy Silver had me doing cabinet drawings for the school and, um, in isometric. And um, so I drew, and back then, everything he did was ink on mylar. So um, I learned inking skills <laughs> and um, learned how to uh, detail cabinets. I worked for Ken Millard, who was a planner and an architect, but his practice was mostly in planning. That, I think, has had a huge impact on my career because since my career is, um, the majority of it is, is um, focused on residential, um, and um, so almost all these projects, when you're doing condominiums and, um, and subdivision work, you know, you're starting with planning, and I've, and I've dealt with a lot of master planning. and. Um, I kind of approach planning different, I think, than most planners because um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking architecture at the same time I'm thinking density, um, heights, and uses, and, 
and so forth. So by the time I finish a master plan, I also have a pretty good idea what the product's going to be within that master plan. I graduated in uh, 1980. 1980 was an interesting time because that kind of also ushered in a recession. And it was kind of a challenging time because uh, I remember here I had my degree, I was ready to go. Um, two years later I was able to get my license, but there was hardly any work out there. And so um, I think we can, many of us can relate to the book um, Tom Wolf wrote of, um, from Ba House to Our House. Um, one of his central themes was every great architect, and I'm not claiming to be a great architect, but they all do their mother's home. And so what got us through that recession was the fact that I designed and built my mother's um, addition on her, on her home, which she still has today. And, um, and by the time we got that addition done, the economy started to pick up and um, things improved. And, um, but that was good training. And I, I would advise, and I do advise, um, anybody who wants to go into architecture should definitely do some construction. I think whether they're working for somebody else or even just doing projects of their own, remodeling their home or building their home, whatever. It wasn't long after school that um, my best friend in school, Bruce McKnight, and myself and another friend, Bob Timmerman, decided that we should start our own firm. So McKnight Shirley Timmerman. And, um, in hindsight, I'm not sure that's the best advice I would give somebody right out of school, um, but it worked fairly well for a, a while. One of the things I discovered is that in architecture school, you learn a lot about design and construction and so forth, but they don't teach you anything about business. And I would advise the school now or any architecture school that there should be classes mandatory on business because you come out of school assuming you're this great new artist and in really you're supposed to be a business person with no experience. And um, so that, that was tough, sustaining the business, keeping the money flowing, um, handling, you know, all that aspect of it. So um, th I think we were in business together for maybe a year, two years. Then we broke, uh, broke off, Bruce moved back to New York, and Bob and I split, and then um, that's when John Shirley and Associates was created. Going into residential kind of evolved. Um, I, it took a natural course. One of my first large jobs as an independent architect was the Red Pine townhomes up at what was then Park West Ski Resort. And the owner of the resort then, Jack Roberts, who was an attorney from Los Angeles who thought he was living the dream by buying a ski resort because he loved to ski, discovered that when you own a ski resort, you don't get to ski, you're running a business. So it was kind of the same thing. He should have known better. Um, but we, we did the Red Pine for him, and which is, still looks great today. I'm, I'm very proud of that project. But because of that project, I was referred to a new client, Dave Gardner, who was down in Utah County. Dave used to be a planner for Provo, Provo City, and he um, quit working for the city and started do, doing some development on his own, but he was still doing private um, consulting. One of his clients was um, Sundance Ski Resort, and since I had just completed this project at Park West Ski Resort, he referred me to Sundance and we went up there, and which really was a, I'd have to say, a big turning point in my career because um, we started designing um, several projects up there for Robert Redford. And um, working for Bob was just a great experience. Um, and it allowed me to really push the limits on design at the time. Um, and to really work with a client who really appreciated good design. I know Bob has a reputation for being an environmentalist, and, and he really is. And to um, develop his, um, his resort, he was very sensitive to preserving the environment as well. And 
on his first project, which were the, um, the cottages that we did there for him, um, we built, of course, this was way before computers, so everything was, you know, three-dimensional in, in cardboard and foam core and so forth, so we had to do extensive surveying on the site. We had to build a site model, a topo model, and then locate every major tree that was on the site and model that in. And then we would play a game with him where we made some um, wood building blocks and we would, that were prototypes for the cottages that we were designing. And then we would play with where we would put them on the site and how we would access them. And um, at the time, he had two, um, two ideas that were, um, I think, kind of revolutionary at the time. One is he wanted to make sure that the car was secondary to the project. So we wound up with some isolated little parking structures. He didn't want garages or carports or anything because he didn't want that to, to take away from the environment. And so the second thing was that you would have a pedestrian walkway or trail to every one of the cottages. And so you would park in a remote spot and then have to walk. And as it turned out, the most remote cottages, which some of them were, the, the farthest one was probably 100 yards away from the parking. And you think, well, who's going to want to schlep their, their bags and their groceries and so forth? Those sold first. And of course, a lot of his clients were associates and friends from Hollywood and were kind of on board with, um, with Bob's thinking. But the one thing I'll, I will always remember is we designed the units so that there was no wall for a TV because he says, when you come up to Sundance, you're not gonna watch TV. You know, you're gonna come here and read and you're gonna... So what do you think the first thing that happened with everyone that sold was everybody wanted to know where they were going to put their TV set. But um, I said, well, Bob, you kind of lose control. Once they buy that unit, they can do whatever they want. <laughs> they may not all be as ideal as you are. But we wound up doing that project. We did the um, amphitheater that they put the summer plays on, the Eccles Theater. Um, we did the um, offices for the Sundance Institute. And we did um, the Creekside um, condominiums or townhomes up there, and, and as well as several homes. And so Sundance was really uh, a, a turning point in, in my career. He had referred me to some friends in Deer Valley, and um, we started doing a couple of homes in Deer Valley. And so the next thing I know is I realize um, our practice is now evolving really around the ski industry. and. Um, recreational second homes, condominium projects. Um, and so from there, we started doing numerous projects in, in the Park City market. And, um, and then once we'd established that market, um, more and more people were coming to us for custom homes in various locations, whether here in the Valley or in the um, ensuing golf communities that were developing around Park City and so forth. And so that um, area has been a very important part of our, um, our office. I still, to this day, since I'm still working part-time, I go through more felt tip markers than the rest of the office. Um, and that's still my major mode of um, design. We were probably an office of about 10 people years ago, and, and one of my associates Greg Stephenson, who's, who's an architect now, um, came to me and said, John, we really need a fax machine. And I said, you know, I, I really don't see the point of having a fax machine unless everybody else has a fax machine because then you won't have anywhere to send it to. And he looked at me and says, John, everybody already has a fax machine. We're, we're the one that doesn't have the fax machine. And that was the turning point. And I realized that technology was gonna be the point of the future. Um, so it wasn't long as when we got our first computers and um, I, I personally feel um, um, bad about the fact that I haven't ever had the time to really put into um, learning the CAD programs and so forth because I've always been so busy trying to keep up with design it was just easier to hand it off to somebody else. We have tried ever since then to try to be on the leading edge of, of technology. 
I think we were one of the first firms in the Valley to go totally into Revit. And at, at that time, it was hard to find the Revit operators because they were coming from you know, CAD offices. Um, of course, now everybody's on Revit. And, and, um, so our office is probably similar to most right now, where if you have um, technological concerns, you go to your youngest employee and find out what they just brought from school. Um, I, one of the things I enjoy with my practice right now, my, my personal practice, is that I work with a lot of these interns that are just coming out of school. And um, so I rely quite heavily on their technological skills. And but, but what happens, they're coming out of school with much less skill in the actual um, process of architecture. And it's also, I think, a great equalizer in, in the profession because um, it used to be only the large firms could afford the technology and now you know, everybody has that same technology just sitting at their desk. And so um, visually, um, graphically, presentation-wise, you know, a one-man firm can come in and look just as good as a very large firm. And I think um, we're, we're truly starting to evolve into more of an international architecture, I think. Um, I'm not sure that's good. I'm not sure it's bad, but, um, but it seems to be that's where it's going. I like to think that my best project is the last one I did. I'm hoping to continually to evolve as an architect and as, as a firm into finding new ways to be creative and to respond to our shifting paradigms that we have right now with, with costs, with availability, with there's so many things, the environment that we have to deal with now. Um, but in terms of projects that were uh, important to me, one in particular that sticks out is um, the Stein Erickson residence, which I mentioned, because um, it was a very difficult project to get approved through the Park City planning. Um, and the client, who was from um, Los Angeles, w when we first had it approved, which took probably a year and a half to get through the process, and it was painful. Um, and then the, the recession hit, and it was put on hold for well over a year, and then I get a call, and he says, um, we just negotiated a deal with Stein Erickson Lodge to be able to have them manage the project and use their name, and we're gonna start over again. I said, well, that's wonderful. I said, but what do you mean by start over again? He says, oh, I've determined in this time that um, the market's shifting, and we want this to be much more contemporary than the original design. And I said, well, you realize that means we've got to go through that whole bloodbath all over again. And he says, I'm willing to take the chance. And that was a very gutsy move on, on their part. Um, so we did, and so the challenge was to create something more contemporary um, at a time when contemporary was not in vogue in Park City that would also be able to pass the judgment of the neighbors and um, we were able to, to pull that off. One of the things I've had to deal with in my career is that Christmas, for most people, means Santa Claus. For me, it means a project has to be done to be marketed for Christmas because it's the ski industry. This one was no different, so we, we completed the model home. We had originally designed the project to be done in three phases, and once they opened the model home, they pre-sold two-thirds of the project in about three weeks over the ski season. It was just an instant hit. And, um, and instead of three phases, all of a sudden we had to try to up our schedule so they could be built out immediately. Um, but probably about a year later, when it was about half built, I had a phone call from one of the major real estate brokers um, there in Park City, who I've known for years. And she said, John, I just had to call you to let you know you've ruined the market up here. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, ever since you opened that model and you're doing SCR, she says, we can't sell any of the other older products because everybody wants a, a new contemporary design. Several years ago, we had a prospective client call and, and set an appointment, came into the office, and um, he was from Atlanta, Georgia. 
and um, he had a very strong southern accent. And so I went in, introduced ourselves, and um, I thought he said he was with HDTV. And I was thinking to myself, isn't everything HD nowadays, you know? But he goes on to tell me about how he needs this home designed, and it's going to be up in Midway, and um, that it's going to um, be a, it's going to be given away as a prize after a lottery. And we've done numerous homes for the Parade of Homes, for um, different charities and so forth. And I thought, well, this is great. And the entire time he's talking to me, I'm waiting for him to pitch me on how much it's just going to cost us to do this home for him for this charity. And um, for some reason, I had to break the conversation for a minute and go into my office. And when I walked into my office, two of the partners came in and said, do you know who that is? And I said, I don't know, somebody with, with some high definition TV um, charitable house or something. And they said, no, no, he's with Home and Garden TV from Atlanta, Georgia. And, um, you know, they have this very popular TV show. I didn't even have cable TV, so I had no idea what HGTV was. And, um, but I went back in, and so um, I asked him, um, so how much is this going to cost us to do your home? Because I guess, we, you know, you're looking for sponsors. I said, oh, no, no, no. We wouldn't even allow you to give your fee. It's going to have to be your full fee because you will not be allowed to be a sponsor. They spent weeks filming this house. And um, it's not by any means one of our larger projects, but it was definitely the most filmed. So I um, was, got used to being interviewed several times for that uh, for that project. Each project is designed for the client. And one of the things I try to um, um, suggest to, to my clients is that they shouldn't be designing to their taste, but they need to be designing to the taste of their market. And so we rely quite heavily on, um, on, on um, real estate research um, so that we know, you know, are you selling to an older clientele? Is it a younger clientele? Um, what's the economics um, and so forth? And where are these people coming from? Um, and that's how they're going to find success. And I think, I can't think of a project that we've done that has failed economically. In hindsight, there were times when I thought that I had gone about the profession wrong in the sense that when I came out of school, Rather than going to work for a large firm and, and learning the business through that experience, I pretty much charted my own course very early on in my career, which um, meant that my learning curve was probably different than those who decided to go work for a larger firm and to, to learn that way. And because of that, I think it, it forced me to kind of, again, learn the business aspect quicker than you would have if, if somebody else is running the business and you're just doing, you know, whatever niche they put you in in that, in that large firm. Um, so I, it was probably the harder route to go, but I don't regret it. Um, I think it gave us, uh, myself and my associates, uh, a different um, perspective on the, on the business than we could have had on a larger firm. But um, I've been blessed with some really good partners over the years. In fact, um, that's, that's one of the um, interesting things, I think, in a career is you start off on your own and all of a sudden you are the business manager, you are the designer, you are the producer, and you're also the bill collector. Um, and then there comes the time when you realize if you want to grow, you have to give up some of these responsibilities. And so I learned very early that, and had to accept the fact that just because somebody else would approach a design or a business aspect differently than you would have, doesn't make that a bad thing. In fact, maybe that's a good thing. And so you start to recognize talent for what it is and, and not relying on yourself. And so giving up 
those types of responsibilities and, and being able to let other people grow in, in their positions, I think was a big turning point in my firm and in, in, in my growth in the industry. What I love right now is because I'm now semi-retired, I just do design. I can just hand it off to production crews and, and to um, technicians to develop it. And it's so wonderful now to see my sketch in a 3D computer model. And, um, I, you know, I love that. And, and I'm finding that um, it changes the way we design things because we see things now so much more clear than we used to. It used to force, as an architect, you'd force the client to have to have an imagination and try to have them have the same imagination that you have, which, which is tough. My advice to anybody who wants to get into architecture is um, more of a, a global idea, and that is, I think to truly be successful in the architecture field, um, you really have to have a passion for this work. Um, it doesn't take long for me to be working with an intern to understand if they either see it as a job or if they really have that passion to make this a lifetime commitment. And as we all know, um, this is not an eight to five job. It's an, it can be an all-consuming job. And I think one of the challenges I've had over my life in, in this profession is just trying to find balance. Um, because as much as I l love doing design, um, you have to balance it with your family and your other interests, whether it's your church, whether it's charities, whether it's the, the sports, the, you know, the outside interests that you have. You it's, it's how to find balance so that you can really make it part of your life but not make it your whole life. I think um, what, I have, what I've seen now in hindsight, and that's what was interesting about being able to have this interview, is um, it's the first time I really kind of stood back and said, well, you know, what's happened over the last 50 years? And um, we've kind of grown with the ski industry. And if you had told me when I was graduating from the U years ago that, um, you know, we'd be an international ski center and that Park City would look like it does now and all these new, I mean, there was no Deer Valley when I graduated and, um, you know, there was Park West, there was no canyons, mega resort. Um, and so forth, and it'll continue to grow. And um, so it's given me an opportunity to, to grow with that industry, which is a little like the stock market because it wasn't all smooth growth. <laughs> when it tanked in, in 2008, um, boy, we went from a large firm to a small firm really quickly, and that really hurt. Um, not just me personally, but that was the first time in my career I had to let people go. Um, which was a, an experience I never want to go through again. Um, but, um, but overall, you know, as I see where we're at today, and um, it, it's been very fulfilling, and I, and I still have a passion for it. You know, I have a number of friends who are, are retired and playing golf or with this and that, and um, architecture has been such a big part of my life that Trying to just give it all up at once would just be not my idea of retirement.